All right, so we're going to be continuing on with a couple more of these case studies uh, before I take you on to some more of the clinical assessments of these case studies. I'm not going to go into all of them. Uh, I'm only going to read about three. Now I'm going to take you into a story of George. This man was 33 years old at the time that I saw him and admitted him to a psychiatric hospital. He stated that his trouble was nervousness, but could give no definite idea of what he meant by the word. He was more remarkably self-composed, showed no indications of restlessness or anxiety, and could not mention anything that had he worried about. He went on to state that his alleged nervousness was caused by shell shock, during the war. He then proceeded to amplify on this in an outlandish story of describing himself as being cast 20 feet into the air by a shell, landing in his de dis decent astride some iron pipes and lying totally unconscious for 60 days, during all of which he hovered between life and death. A physician examination showed George without any evidence of injury or illness. In fact, he was a remarkably strong and active man, six feet in height, 170 pounds in weight. Later, in an athletic meet held on the hospital grounds, he showed himself an exceptional sprinter and broad jumper, surpassing many old, able competitors 10 years younger than himself in these events. Prolonged observations in psychiatric study brought out no sign or suggestion of a psychosis or a psychoneuroses. Despite his original complaint of nervousness, he was at all times calm and without the slightest evidence of abnormal anxiety. He ate and slept well, did not complain of any worries, was free of phobias, compulsions, conversions, reactions, tics, and all other ordinary neurotic manifestations. Records of this man's career show that he was he had been confined in various mental hospitals approximately half the time since he became of age. In addition to periods ranging from a few weeks to six months at federal government institutions in Texas, Tennessee, Mississippi, Georgia, and Florida, he was also frequently sent by the government, government to private psychiatric hospitals and in invalid homes. Between these experiences, he spent a good part of his time in the local county jail or in other jails in Birmingham, Montgomery, Mobile, or other towns which he visited. He was taken into sometimes for drunkenness and orderly conduct, disorderly conduct, at other times for writing bad checks, petty theft, reckless driving of automobiles, <clears throat> obtaining money under false pretenses, snatching the purse from a prostitute, taking possessions of a house whose owner often went off on vacation, etc. Extravagant but insincere threats to harm his wife and four children made, ap made after taking a few drinks and lunacy charges also accounted for a dozen or so arrests. During all the observations at various hospitals mentioned above, as well at the, as well as at a state mental hospital where George also spent a short time no technical evidence of a psychosis or a psychoneurosis is, is mentioned. His wife and friends have repeatedly persuaded local authorities to consider him as mentally deranged and to have him sent to a hospital rather than to let him face the various charges brought against him for time to time. On other occasions, when refused admission by hospitals that had already studied him or more than once declared him sane, competent, and not in need of psychiatric treatment, friends and relatives have had him arrested, prevailed upon local doctors to sign statements that he is deranged and dangerous and brought pressure to bear so that hospitals, with the light in which the case was presented, had no choice but to readmit him. <clears throat> the doctor involved in such procedures, country practitioners for the most part, were mentioned, were mentioned, never mentioned technical evidence that would indicate a psychosis or a psychoneurosis as they are described in the, in the textbook. Such statements as the followers are typical. 
<clears throat> something is in quote. Something is decidedly wrong mentally. I don't think that I have ever come in contact with a man as unreliable as he is. He worries everybody that he that has fooled with him until they hate him. The country authorities are tired of boarding him as he is not a criminal. This is the family's physician statement. Everyone who comes in contact with him agrees that he should be confined permanently, very reliable as to his word of honor. This is the county physician. A physician who owns a private hospital located at a town nearby and explaining his refusal to accept the patient again ends by saying, we do not cater to his class, end quote. He is described as frequently drinking whiskey to excess and is sometimes taking veronal, luminal, amethyl, and bromides to ease himself in the aftermath of a spree. Although there is no records of alcoholic hallucinations, many bizarre and notable actions are described when the patient has had something to drink. Suddenly, I want to have throat problems all of a sudden. All right, the following is going to be all of his drinking actions. On a cold February day, he rushed fully clothed down to the creek and sprained in. After tr thrashing about, yelling and cursing to no purpose, and creating a senseless commotion, he swam back to land without difficulty. One fine spring evening, he is said to have run entirely neck through the streets of the town. He once sat up all night under the house, striking matches aimlessly. Generally believed reports indicate that late one night, he, with several drinking companions, succeeded in releasing a half-tamed bear from the cage in which it is kept at a filling station and a track trade. A good deal of fright, some civic uproar, and hasty precautionary measures ensued. A seedious and painstaking efforts by the number of local volunteers led to a bear's relatively uneventful return to his cage. <clears throat> According to available information, the bear was not terribly dangerous, but sufficiently so to make a man of anything like ordinary responsibility sharply restrain all impulses to lose him on the outskirts of an unprepared community. The patient denied having been a party to this exploit, but the evidence again against him is strong. In view of this man's failure to make any effort to conduct himself sensibly though so many years, there is no wonder that many are found to say that he is of unsound mind. He has done no work except for occasional periods when for a week or 10 days, he would show considerable promise as an automobile salesman clerk in a grocery store, soda joker, bootlegger, assistants, etc. It was not long ago before, in the language of an elderly uncle often called on to deal with these problems, he proceeded to launch himself on another pot, valiant, infectious, rigaboom, rigadoon. After studies on his case were completed and on the basis of his corporative and technical same behavior, he was given parole privileges. He promised, of course, not to drink or to break any other rules of good conduct and expressed many fine intentions positively and reassuringly. Six days later, he staggered into the ward and attempted to go to bed without being noticed by the attendant on being found so plainly in his cups. He raved pet pet petulantly, first denied any contact with stimulants, and finally, with indignation, admitted having taken one half glass of beer. His eyes were bloodshot. He could scarcely stand. He spoke in wild, boastful, almost unintelligible accents. A bottle of cheap whiskey was discovered hidden under his mattress. According to the customs on of the hospital, George was now confined to a closed ward where his superficial sanity, sanity stood out arrestingly with the delusional babbling and the blank face staring inertias of his psychotic fellows. He was 
always intelligent and agreeable, frequently pointed out the obvious inconsistencies of his, of his being confined among insane people. Pleading important business downtown, he was, after three weeks, given a pass to go out of the care of the hospital attendant for a few hours. He returned in good condition, but when night came on, on, he refused to go to bed, cursed and sped at the nurse who tried to advise him. His breath reeked of raw liquor, and the search disclosed a half-empty quart bottle in his pocket. The attendant who took him to town denied having allowed him to purchase whiskey and could only surmise in astonishment that the patient may have slipped off for a moment and obtained a bottle while pretending to go to the toilet. A few weeks after this incident, the patient's wife came to town and asked to take him out on a pass, agreeing to assume full responsibility. When she returned him to the hospital, it was evident that he had drunk liberally and the wife confessed herself as having been unable to deal with him. The next day, a man living near the hospital advised that he had that he had fired a revolver at the patient on being alarmed by his behavior. George, after loitering about the premises, boisterous and vaguely threatening, began to fumble at a window as if trying to force his way in. The shot had been aimed at George, but only in his general direction in order to frighten him. This end was satisfactorily achieved, for at the report, he made off in a clatter of undignified haste. About a month later, on strong promises of good behavior, George was again given the parole. Within a few days, he climbed over a fence and hired an, an automobile, which after racing for a while, about a road to no special purpose, he wrecked in the city streets and was taken to jail. The, this cycle of event was repeated several more times. The man was obviously not where he belonged when confined on a closed ward with extremely psychotic patients of an ordinary type. Just as plainly, he showed himself unable to remain on an open ward with wild, mildly psychotic patients who succeeded in adapting themselves to a life of limited freedom. Finally, and being kept under close supervision for several weeks following a senseless and troublesome spree, he demanded his discharge in a well-written letter emphasizing his sanity and the inappropriateness of his hospitalization. He was released accordingly. <clears throat> Six months later, he was sent back to the hospital from his local jail, where he had been confined after striking a Negro man with a pole, pole axe. He had, as was his want, as his want, his drinking, but showed little evidence of being affected by alcohol. The other man was walking peacefully by when, by when our patient engaged him in a dispute about possessions of a pave, pavement. <laughs> This is what he says in quotes. Flying with insolence and perhaps with wine, he found the other conciliatory attitude. Conciliatory means intended to gain goodwill and favor, not to his taste. So the black man was obviously being courteous and ingratiating him. <laughs> Here's the balls. I'll get off the pavement and get out of your way. So he's racist as well, along with being psychopathic. So this is, didn't suit his taste, apparently waxed more overbearing and ended by failing his presumed adv advise adversary with a death blow. He did not on this occasion seem to lose control of himself like a man in a genuine rage who might have struck blow after blow. He d his deed seemed prompted more by fractiousness. Fractiousness means unruly and troublesome and impulses to show off than by violent passion. His application for admission was at first refused by the hospital since only patients suffering from mental disorders in the commonly accepted sense are eligible. His wife and influential friend thereupon invoked higher authorities who arranged for him to be taken. This time he was again found to be free from all symptoms of recognized mental disorders and was classified as one, no nervous or mental disease, and two, had no psychopathic personalities. How is this possible? 
So you see that even the professionals are incompetent at this point in the game. How is this not psychopathic personalities? He did not complain of nervousness as he had at the time of his first admission, but instead insisted that he was sane and a well man and demanded full privileges to come and go as he pleased, saying that the authorities who arranged for him to come to the hospital had promised him this. It was plain that George regarded the hospital simply as an expedient by which he might escape the legal consequences of his behavior. <clears throat> After being kept for a few weeks on a closed ward, he was allowed to go out on the grounds along with the understanding that after a few days he would be discharged as sane and competent. He could not, however, keep out of trouble. On the third day of his freedom, he was seen by a guard driving at high speed through a gate in the car belonging to one of the physicians. <laughs> Chase was offered, and after a lively race, he was overtaken about 15 miles from the hospital, having battered in a fender and knocked off a headlight of a car on the way. He is hardly necessary. It is hardly necessary to point out that this man had repeatedly been instructed in the rules to be observed while on parole, that he knew the driving of an automob automobile by a patient in this hospital to be a serious violation of his trust, not to speak of the death or the unauthorized borrowing he proclaimed it to be. When finally caught, he appeared as sane as before, showing no evidence of any episodic loss of his usual reasoning power. He had not been drinking when he took the automobile, and of course, the pursuit was not too hot for him to obtain liquor while in flight, though in view of his previously demonstrated ingenuity and dispatch in fulfilling this want, it was scarcely... <laughs> I've been surprised to find a properly round. <laughs> I'm sorry, God. <laughs> Can you imagine him frantically trying to get to the liquor store <laughs> as they're like pursuing him on this hot pursuit? So he didn't have time to drink. <laughs> Let me repeat it. He had, not been, he had not been drinking when he took the automobile, and of course the pursuit was too hot for him to obtain liquor while in flight, though in view of his previously demonstrated ingenuity and dispatch in fulfilling this want, <laughs> it would scarcely have been surprising to find him properly rattled. On his return to the hospital, he did not show the slightest sign of remorse over having taken possession of and having succeeded in damaging the car belonging to a physician who had always been particularly kind to him. The owner's willingness to free him from his responsibility for his deed, he took as a matter of course, expressing neither gratitude nor satisfaction. In fact, he dismissed the whole matter as insignificant. And his prevailing attitude was that of a man generally ill-used. Some weeks later, he was sent home. About six months afterward, his wife telegraphed the hospital that she could no longer cope with her husband, whom she described as being still in such folly as they already recounted. He did not, however, arrive by the train he boarded. He was subsequently learned that he got off along the way, obtained a few drinks, and made a cool, clamorous nuisance of himself in the station until the police came to cut short his activities. A little later, he was readmitted following a series of misadventures in no way different from those already mentioned, but including a period in a state mental hospital. He was alert and rational and just as he had always been before, except for the presence of a, a earthral discharge of gonococcic origins. He had a false account of his activities, saying that he had been working on a farm and had been in trouble at all, had been no trouble at all. The records show that he had not turned his head to make an honest dollar since he left and that a week had seldom passed without his uh, buffoonish or antisocial activities arousing cons consternations in the neighborhood and bringing him to the attention of the police. He was freely communicative and scarcely waited for encouragements to give an explanation of how he came to buy his gonorrhea. The records show that after causing some commotion in town by 
maudlin or threatening outbursts on the street and silly pompous threats about harm and his wife, he had been brought in bedraggled and disconsolate, disconsolate from a ditch where he lay and confined confined into jail. The jail, George said, was crowded, and the jailer, who knew him to be a good fellow, placed him in a cell on a woman's section of the building. The bars of his cells were about six inch apart, and so according to his story, he was separated from the yet provocatively close to the woman's prisoners. These, his neighbors, were seven girls ranging in age of 14 to 20 and awaiting transportation to the woman's reformatory. He said that at night, when the lights were off, these girls would disrobe and come to the bars and would entice him, calling him pretty boy, hey, country boy, <laughs> and otherwise teasing and challenging him until he began to indulge in sexual intercourse with them between the bars in order to make them leave him alone. He said that he continued this, this practice with each of them every night during the rest of his sojourn there. The transactions taking place always in the dark and through the separating barriers. From one or all of these women, he said that he caught the gun of real, which now troubled him. He appeared to be no little proud of his story, which, however, is probably no more accurate than his stories of explanatory behaviors and hard work on his frequently expressed intentions to conduct himself like a sensible person. During prolonged observations of him in the hospital, he showed himself more prone and drift about street corners and bars to indulge in petty gambling or theft, to catch and impose on chance acquaintances, or to raise some puerile and futile clamor that that to see intercourse with one woman, much less with many. <clears throat> Since this last admission, his story has been the same as before. On recovering from gonorrhea, he was, after being found sane and competent, giving freedom of grounds. He soon left without permission and was found in the hands of the police. Back again on a closed board, he was dissatisfied with his irrefutable arguments, pointed out the incongruity of his being assigned to a a place among men content to sit all day in silence, staring blankly at nothing of who burden. Uh, murmured in, in incessantly that their heads were full of gold, radium, and diamonds. <laughs> Let me repeat this. Back again on a closed ward, he was dissatisfied and with irrefutable arguments pointed out the incongruity of his being assigned to a place among men content to sit, sit all day in silence, staring blankly at nothing, or murm who murmured incessantly that their heads were full of gold, radium, and diamonds, oh my, and that they had no stomachs or intestines, and that the masons were playing on their sexual organs by radio, and they were sickened by the odors of the bells. It was here, however, that George had to be kept, a perfectly clear-minded person, neat, polite, and quick-witted, in striking contrast to his fellows, whose lips, whose inarticulately as they responded to hallucinatory voices and some of whom who urinated and defecated on themselves sought to eat dead roaches etc this was not of course an ordeal environment for him he was therefore replaced on the parole ward time after time on the proof to only to prove himself after periods from a few days to a few weeks unadaptable when put on the closed ward among better adjusted cases of schizophrenia or dementia para paralytia, paralytica, men who worked on the farm detail or at woodwork, he took advantage of his situation and escaped. During much of his time in the hospital, it was therefore been necessary to keep him among the actively disturbed or badly deteriorated cases where supervision is complete and possibilities of escape are limited. When last heard from, he was again hospitalized opportunities are continually offered him to improve his situation. From time to time, parole is restored, and occasionally his wife takes him home on, on furlough. Always, however, he causes trouble for himself and others, and always for no discernible purpose. The last few news of him was that he violated his parole by leaving the hospital. After sustaining himself by his customary activities for a week or 10 days and staying clear of the police, he again came to grief. 
with the aim evidently of stealing a hen or a few friars, or perhaps to evade pursuit, he slipped into a Negro farmer's chicken house. Having brought along a bottle and perhaps being delayed by need to avoid detection, he drank injudiously. Next morning, he was found in a coop where he had apparently wallowed and groped through the night. Called by the farmer, attendant brought him to the hospital. Here on the closed ward, he find, we find him among helpless and irrational people, subject to the strict control and attention required for those who cannot direct themselves. Though he left school after completing the eighth grade, he writes letters which would do credit to a college graduate. In these, he insists on having his freedom, stating that his difficulties in the past have been minor and that he is ready to thoroughly be able to settle down and have an exemplary life. He often stresses the fact that his wife and children need his protection and support. His family history is entirely negative. Parents and grandparents were hardworking, sober folks, liked and respected in the little rural community where the present generation lives. One sister and three brothers are leading normal lives there today. And that's the end of this guy, George. We're at 26 minutes. I'm gonna start with another story, a guy named Jack. <clears throat> Actually, I'm going to stop and start another video.